Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very excited and honored to be bringing the conversation I had with Marve Emery. She is a professor of literature at Oxford. She is also a critic at The New Yorker. And she is also a well-established writer. She has a bachelor's from Harvard and a PhD from Yale. She is the author of numerous books, uh, including Paraliteri, Making of Bad Writers in Post-War America, The Ferrante Letters, Personality Brokers, and she recently did the annotated uh, Mrs. Dalloway. She, as I mentioned, she's a contributing writer at The New Yorker, and she's had her publications in everything. New York Review of Books, Harper's, New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, London Review of Books on American Literature, uh, and many other places. She is also the Shapiro Silverberg Distinguished Writer in Residence at Wesleyan University. And so she is quite established in her field. She's definitely uh, one of the go-to people within literary criticism. Uh, I've followed her work for a long time, and I was really, really happy to have this conversation and and talk to her. I I love all of her writing. I I absolutely uh, really find her, her thoughts uh, quite brilliant, and so I was I was really really excited to to talk to her about many aspects of uh, literature and criticism in general. We start the conversation by uh, kind of defining what is literary criticism and why that's important to to know and to study. We talk about the different ways uh, of reading, of how people read, and how they come to various texts, both current and uh, and historical. We talk about what is the author's intent and how essential or non-essential that may be for literature. Uh, We had a really, really fascinating uh, bit of the conversation there. We talk about some of the contours of the literary genre and why genre is important. We talk about various forms of interpretation. Um, And then we we end kind of talking about one of the pieces she wrote um, uh, about the the book Heaven uh, by Kawakami and uh, how it's juxtaposed with some of the work with Nietzsche. Um, and so, again, overall, I mean, this this conversation was just an absolute delight for me. Um, I was so enriched by it. Uh, she's a, as you, you'll hear, she's a really wonderful, wonderful thinker, um, very pleasant to, to talk to, and just very engaging, which I think is important for um, the arts and the humanities and for literature. We need more people like her. Uh, make sure you subscribe to my uh, Substack, uh, convergingdialogues.substack.com to um, get this episode and all the previous episodes and uh, anywhere else that you may find uh, your podcast. And uh, now I bring you Monterey Emery. I am here with Marve Emery. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really, really am looking forward to it. Thank you for having me. Yes, yes. I'm a very big fan of your writing, very big fan of your work. And so it's a, it's a big honor. Um, you write all the time, which is insane. I, I don't know how you do it. I have no idea how you do it. I know you have a family and stuff. So, I mean, it's I'm not it's doing it today. To I'm not doing it today. <laughs> right. spent, You're not doing it now. Right. Today, home with a sick kid. He's watching <laughs> Kung Fu Panda. We've played like 18 rounds of sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so you you are human after all, which is good. I am. I am human. <laughs> I even uh, let him win. I even let him win at sorry. You're very nice. Um, <laughs> so you, you've written so many marvelous pieces. Um, and then you've written a handful of books and you've annotated stuff. So just some of them, the Personality Brokers, Strange History of Myers-Briggs and the Birth of Personality Testing, which was a lot of fun to read. Uh, Paraliterary lit- literary is a... Uh, is a great book. I enjoyed that one as well. And you did the annotated Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, which was super, I mean, it's, I mean, obviously packaged very nicely. It's very interactive. You have all the notes and the introduction. This had to be in a lot of fun to, 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 to put together now. It was my pandemic project. It was oh, done during the first, I think, seven, eight months of lockdown from mm. March, 2020 until August, 2020. So so you were just you were just kicking it with Virginia for seven eight months. <laughs> well, and my whole family, but uh, yes, right. <laughs> Virginia um, was an honorary member. We have um we have many uh, mutual likes and interests. Do you like um, what's the the book Heaven? What's the author? The Japanese one? Yeko Kawakami. 
Yes, I yes, absolutely love her work. Um, we love, obviously, the Ferrante novels, which are yep. marvelous. They're absolutely marvelous. I, I really adore them tremendously. Um, so we have a lot of, uh, we read a lot of the same things. Of course, this is your your day job. So, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you like doing it, but I'm sure you sort of have to do it too. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, you, you read a lot of really awesome stuff. Thank um, you. And uh, is it John Fossa? Is that the is that the uh, the septology? Is that right? You, yeah. Well, it's funny. It's kind of a joke in our family because it's. I think in Norwegian that's pronounced Jun Fossa, but totally I off. like him. I like him so much, and he's become such a sort of invisible, ghostly presence in our house that my older son refers to him as John Fussy, <laughs> which has now become Fussy Fussy John. So that's great. That's great. I think I, it's how he, how he marks his sense of, of, of jealousy says so you're reading <laughs> fussy John again. <laughs> well, I, um, I just got it and it looks great. And I know the translator is, um, Damien Searles. Searles. Yeah. He's fantastic. He wrote a great book on the Rorschach. Yep. So it's a lot of, a lot of really, really good stuff. So, um, you've, you've done a bunch of reviews and many wonderful things like that. So, okay. So before we get into it, cause I want to, I want to talk about Myers Briggs. Uh, maybe we'll save some time for that. But most of the stuff on literary criticism in general. Mm -hmm. So, for for people that uh, don't know you, uh, just give me your potted biography. Tell me uh, who you are, what your background's in, and what you study and what you mostly write on. Oh well, I was. I'll start from the beginning. I was okay. born in a small town. No, I'm joking. I won't do that. I won't do that to you. Uh, so I am. Uh, a professor of literature, that is one of my jobs. I have a PhD in English literature, and I teach in a university, and I write scholarly books, academic books like Paraliterary, The Making of Bad Readers in Post-War America. I'm currently working on a follow-up to that called Post-Discipline. Mm, nice. The what's happened to literary study in the last 30 years and mm what kind of a crisis of the humanities we're facing. Mm. So part of the work that I do is very much within academic literary studies. And then there's another part of the work that I do, which is outside of the academy. I work as a literary critic. I'm a contributing writer at The New Yorker, but I also write for places like The New York Review of Books and The London Review of Books. And the work that I do there is more about I think passionately advocating for, but also trying to model forms of reading and writing about books for mm. non-specialist audiences. Mm. That is not the kinds of audiences that I'm writing for when I'm writing my scholarly books, which are other scholars and or graduate students, mm. but people who might pick up the New Yorker, or the New York Review of Books and have day jobs wildly different from what you or I do and just try to convince them to go buy a book by Miyoko Kawakami or a book by Elena Ferrante. And once they've read it, to try to show them the kinds of interesting interpretations, arguments, forms of appreciation that they can bring to bear on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say no. that those are the two, the two ways that I think about the different kinds of work that I do. And I could say, I could break those down further, but I'll, I'll pass it back to you. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. Yes. I, I, I get the New Yorker and it's always a joy to see physically, uh, something, another piece that you've written. It's like, Oh, and she's written another wonderful piece of course. So it's uh it's very nice to read your stuff, uh, there. Um, speaking of in terms of how this should be applied for certain people or, or for, for other folks, I was talking to somebody the other day mm. and they asked me, they said, you know, you read all the time, right? And I said, yes, I do. And Many people have noticed this <laughs> and I say, yeah, and I read and I, and I'm very interactive when I read, right? I dog ear, I write, I, I don't use a highlighter anymore, but I do write in the margins. Mm -hmm. Um, I put notes in there. I, I'm very interactive and, and I'm sometimes I will have a notebook aside and I, I, I I'm, I'm thinking as I'm reading and, and I say, well, how, did, how did you learn to do that? Where did you learn to do that? And I said, there's one thing you should read. You should read how to read a book by Adler. It's a fantastic book and I highly recommend it. And this person was like, are you serious? I was like, I promise you, I, I'm not playing a joke. There's a book that says how to read a book and it's written. I don't remember when it was written it was many decades ago and it's fabulous. And then this person got the book and they read it and they were like, oh, wow. 
holy shit, you were right. Like this, this is so helpful. Wow. This was really, really great. And so there's, there's sometimes certain books that will stand out. And so, um, I think it's, I only say that story because I think it's wonderful that you're, uh, trying to make modern and, uh, you know, I guess classic or ancient literature, um, you know, I think attainable for for general audiences and then still engaging with more uh more with critics in that space as well i think that's a it's really nice how you do kind of both aspects of it so i think it's i think it's important i think the work you're doing is really important for literature and the humanities and for for reading in general um and for art and so i think it's it's really really important thank you it's important to it's important to me i think that we are at a difficult moment we are at a crossroads with the study of literature and the production of literature more generally. So one of the things that I think about a lot in my work is how is it that we can take the kinds of techniques, mm. reading and writing and speaking about books that have until this point been historically limited to the academy and it's relatively narrow or exclusive audiences and bring those to readers who might not feel at home mm. in academic spaces for various reasons and bring those techniques to them in ways that do not diminish but intensify the pleasure mm. that they might gain from what they read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That I seems to me right now. Yeah, yeah, I, I really agree. And especially as we move in a forward in time in a digital age and with technological advancements and, you know, there's different ways to get the material, but I think it's important to to learn, you know, the science and technique and to have exposure and to keep doing that. I, I think it's important. And also to bring the kinds of digital technologies that we're seeing into dialogue with older technologies of reading mm -hmm. and writing. Mm -hmm. One of the things that interested me about the way you presented the annotated Mrs. Dalloway was that you said it's so well packaged mm -hmm. and there is something about it that is multimedia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has its maps, it has its illustrations, mm -hmm. it has its notes, and there's a kind of continuum mm -hmm. between the formatting that one can encounter in a different kind of book, like an annotated edition, and the formatting that we are perhaps more used to seeing on our screens, mm -hmm. sidebars and the ability to scroll and the ability to pull up images. So I think part of what's also important to me is that we think carefully about the kinds of connections there are between the past, the present and the future mm -hmm. of how we read and how we write about what we're reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think in that example of of Mrs. Dalloway, it's it's coming alive in a way, but it's it's not doing the work for you either. So it's it's a very nice uh, kind of compliment there. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's just real quick um, literary criticism, right? Yes. What is it? Why is it important? We've talked about a little bit about it, but why do we understand or how do we understand criticism? You know, officially, I guess, from an average layperson's perspective, and then from actual people in literature currently and how mm -hmm. they're thinking about it. Why is this important? And why is this field or discipline or subgenre, or whatever you want to describe it, important and still important uh, now? I don't know that anyone really understands what criticism is. I think that we know what reviewing is. We know what journalism is or reporting, and we know what scholarship is. But criticism is this strange, somewhat amorphous category that seems to arise from its inability to fit cleanly into any of those other categories, mm. which is the one of the reasons I like it, because it is this wonderfully hybrid genre, I think. And I think it gives you a lot of room to experiment with what I was saying before with different ways of both modeling knowledge, modeling technique and transmitting pleasure. Mm. So to my mind, that is what the best criticism can do. It can offer an interpretation of a work or a series of works or an idea about literature. And it can do that in a way, as I said before, that deepens a non-academic reader's understanding of how it is that they should be approaching that book, that 
work of that body of literature, uh, a particular genre or what have you. So to my mind, that is what literary criticism is and what it should be doing. And part of its wonder, I think, derives from the difficulty that we have in identifying precisely what it is. Mm. There's a really great book that has just come out by a scholar I very much admire and who my work is in dialogue with most closely, I think. His name is John Guillory, and the book is called Professing Criticism. Mm. And many of the thoughts that I have about criticism come from that book or have been sharpened by thinking alongside that book. And one of the things that he says that I find extremely interesting is that the critic whether in the 19th century in the leading Victorian periodicals or today in the 21st century in the pages of magazines or even on Substack or on Twitter or through any of these new digital forms or platforms, the critic is self-authorized. Mm. This is a direct quote from him. The critic is self-authorized, which means the critic is someone who has the capacity to instantiate or to call into being his or her own audience. Hmm. And that audience is not circumscribed by a particular institution, the way that the audiences of scholars, for instance, tend to be circumscribed by the school hmm. and the university, and even within the university, by who happens to be a holder of a PhD in a particular discipline. Hmm. So against that model of specialization or of limitation might be a more damning way to think about it. <laughs> the critic has the capacity to bring into being entirely new audiences that mm. draw from other mm. audiences that might be institutionalized or housed in different kinds of places. Mm. And again, that for me is also important and goes hand in hand with the kind of amorphousness of criticism mm -hmm. that I was talking about earlier. So it's almost in that way, like a door that's opening to other things or or, or bridge of sorts of trying to yeah. have a, a some type of, of pathway or highway for people to have from different genres or arenas to then mm -hmm. engage and in, in, interact with, no? Uh, yeah, I think that's a really nice way of putting it. Another way that I might put it is that Criticism lets us triangulate different kinds of objects mm -hmm. and to triangulate different kinds of styles. So I don't often write personal essays, for instance, but in almost everything I write, there is a scene in which I am present as a character mm. or where I am narrating an encounter that I have had with a literary object. Mm. And sometimes those scenes are true, and sometimes those scenes are imagined, mm. but there is a kind of fiction that is mm. being created mm. within criticism that reaches out to the reader and says, here, inhabit this world mm -hmm. with me. Mm. I am a person like you, and we can look at this object and produce knowledge about this object together. Mm. But it's not merely because you're kind of doing a meta thing there, right? Because it's not merely just subject object, right? It's not only that, right? There no, is a no. quasi or sort of phenomenological aspects as well. If this whole shared, if you will, experience with the 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 the, um, the reader, and then you know, for you as the writer, and then as you're saying, in this kind of uh, picture or in this in this scene, is is so. It's not just merely subject object, no. No, I think I'm essentially a kind of unreconstructed Kantian in this sense. <laughs> I think that one's subjective reaction to an object can be so powerful that it can essentially become objectified, mm, mm, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. you can have such an intense experience of pleasure or pain or disgust or boredom or rapture or some mingling of those things yeah. when you encounter an artwork that it can escape your own sensorium and mm -hmm. you can begin mm -hmm. to talk about it and you can begin to justify that experience even if you can't completely uh, reenact or rehabilitate it for another person. But I do think that that is where criticism begins. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in, in paraliterary, you talk about some of the institutions that spawned bad readers in the 20th uh, century in the U.S., but without going throughout the whole book, I guess, because it's kind of setting up for other things I want to ask, you mentioned in that book how people would look to literature for personal identification, emotion, interaction, and that that's not always a positive thing, although I don't think you're making it a black and white negative positive, but um there you, you, in the book you talk about the various ways in which we can read which kind of goes to my my, my first uh, uh story about how to read a book and stuff mm-hmm. and you can have imitation and feeling and and so sh- <laughs> not that you're you're the oracle that tells us how to read things but how do how do we <laughs> how do we read or not read literature mm-hmm. with human emotion or various experiences right so are we kind of what you're saying like how much of uh, do we divorce our own selves from placing too much into the into the text from our own lived experience with in, in in another way kind of having it come to us instead of us going to it or is there a kind of uh co uh, evolution or kind of co or like a reciprocal nature of that of how do you think about that of the the person reading and then the stuff coming from the page to the person well i should say first of all that I am intensely forgiving and largely non-judgmental about how people read things or frankly what they read. Mm. I know that I have my own tastes and mm. I have my own judgments, but I truly do not believe that there are right or wrong ways mm. in which one reads. Mm. I think that in paraliterary I'm interested in looking at ways of reading that have historically been devalued or have been marginalized as quote unquote bad like reading for imitation or reading for feeling as you mentioned and figuring out how we might bring a little bit more rigor or a little bit more specificity mm-hmm. to discuss what it means when we say that we read a novel and want to be like a character in it mm. or when we say that we read a novel and fall in love with it or with mm. a character in it or use it to triangulate the love that we feel for another person mm. i'm reading a lot of italo calvino right now for mm. a project and i just finished if on a winter's night a traveler which is a very important novel to me and a novel that's entirely about that question how is it that a novel can be the object that triangulates between mm. the person addressed in that book as the reader mm-hmm. and the person invoked in that book as the other reader the mm. woman who the reader is in love with mm. so that's just one thing i would say which is that i don't think it makes sense to judge the ways that people read to answer the question that you asked a little bit more specifically, I think it's important to realize that any time we're reading, we're probably having multiple different kinds of experiences of reading. Mm. So when I read a book, there is certainly part of me that is thinking, okay, if I were going to make an argument about this book, and if I had to make that argument in the classroom or in a 5,000 word piece, what argument would I want to make? And based on that, what am I looking for as I'm reading? But at the same time, there's another part of me that's thinking, oh, God, I love this sentence. Look at how wonderfully this adjective fits with this noun. Isn't that amazing that he managed to do that? I think I'm going to use that word in the next thing that I write about something entirely unrelated to this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there's a third part of me that's thinking, I've had that feeling before. I know someone exactly like that character. I just got into a version of this argument with my husband two weeks ago. And so I just think that any model of reading that insists on either a singular or a kind of pure approach to anything is is simply incorrect. Mm -hmm. This is the other kind of Kantian insight, right, is that (laughs) our experiences, our aesthetic experiences are almost always impure and they can be moralistic, they can be hedonistic, they can be economically motivated, they can be aesthetic, they can be political. But ultimately, it doesn't make much sense to say there's one kind of reading that is the kind of reading we want people to pursue. Mm -hmm. And they can pursue it in some kind of isolated, absolutely refined form. It's interesting. 
I, so I totally agree with you about the different the different types of or the parts of you, I guess. So there's like a there's the gestalt of you, right? There's like mm-hmm. you reading it, but then there's all of these parts, right? The parts in the whole and things like that, which I I totally anyone that's a big reader um will probably identify i certainly identify with that when i read i'm like oh wow the same thing that's a great word or you know yes I, that character sucks or well, i really feel connected to this character you know, we all do i think that's that's really good and really interactive reading um so that all makes sense i guess i'm wanting to kind of maybe park here for a minute about the the rigor so this this goes to my next next question here so okay so what about um something that uh a lot i'll show my cards a long time ago mm-hmm. um a i i went to a seminary mm-hmm. and i'm not religious anymore most people know that by now right clinical psych is my world so i'm not i'm not uh i'm not religious anymore but i was uh trained um in a seminary with languages and uh, textual criticism and hermeneutics and exegesis and all that and one of the ways we were trained was very much focusing on author's intent right now this would be for different types of you know uh scriptures and you know we look at all these different texts and so i want to so you, you can expand some of these principles of of interpretation to interpretation in general. So I'm a big fan of E.D. Hirsch. I mean, I had to read a lot of his stuff. He's he's yeah. fantastic. Um, and so I, what I want to know from you is, and from your perspective and how you see things, how do we look, should we, and how do we look for author's intent? So, right? so many times people nowadays will very much take that postmodern approach of, well, whatever I want it to mean, or this is my interpretation, which isn't necessarily wrong, but... Where do we place the role of the author's intent and how important is that for reading classic literature or more modern literature? Um, and how do we de- derive meaning or various meanings of a text with or without the author's intent? I suppose my answer to that would come from the experiences I've had interviewing and spending time with mm. lots of authors, which is, I think, often their work knows more than they do. And I realize that that might sound mystical, (laughs) but I I don't mean it to. What I mean is really very simple, which is that I think that the work and the whole of the work or the way it is built up from the sum of its parts can actually have unintended and perhaps what might seem to the author merely incidental effect. Sure. But isn't there a, 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 there may be a intention or some intentions an author may have for their work, no? Sure. But I just think that if they have that intention, that intention will be present in the work. If it's not present in the work, then I'm not sure that it matters. Or to me, it mm-hmm. matters yeah. only if you're interested in a kind of literary history yeah, that yeah. is essentially biographical and perhaps institutional in mm-hmm, nature, mm-hmm, which my mm-hmm. first book is. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm just saying that that's one kind of question sure. we might be interested in. Mm-hmm. But it's not concerning to me that some mm-hmm. people are not interested in that question or that intent seems to them beside the point of how you encounter a literary work or an artistic work of any kind. I just think that these are different frames for approaching artworks Mm -hmm. that presuppose that you're interested in different kinds of questions Mm -hmm. and different ways of going about answering them. Mm. So for you, it's, it lives in the work itself, like kind of the first point that this, this mystical piece of it, that it's, it's in the work, right? So if I read, if I read, hmm, if I read Demons by Dostoevsky, which is one of my favorites by him, it's really good. Um, you know, it's, I can get what's there or what's in there from the work itself without knowing anything necessarily what Dostoevsky meant or intended or whatever. I mean, obviously it's a political novel in the 1860s of Russia, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But the work itself is what lives on. And that's where we find the meaning. Yeah. Yeah, I would perhaps say that the corollary to that is that I think it's important to know about history. So Mm. I think that there are things about, just to go to the example that's at hand, I think there are things about Dalloway, about Mrs. Dalloway, for Mm -hmm. instance, that you understand better Mm -hmm. 
when you understand yeah. something about the political situation in England in the early 1920s. Mm -hmm. I think it would be difficult, for instance, to understand the stakes of that novel without knowing anything about the First World War. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying in this case is that I think that there are ways that history in a larger sense, i.e. not the history of the individual or not the intent of the individual, yeah. can be important for deepening our appreciation of what we are reading. And I would say that that's probably more important than conversations about intent, which I've never really been sure what that gets us mm. one way mm. or another. Mm. Yeah. I mean, let me ask as an example here. Um, this might, I don't think it's a rabbit trail. I think it, it can be helpful here. So let's use the Neapolitan novels because I love those yeah. and, and yeah. I'm sure you do as well. You know, what do you, what do you think in that, in that scenario there where there's <laughs> like, I, look, I, I, I've read all four novels, right? I've seen the, uh, the TV show adaptation, which is quite good too. Um, I can take whatever I want from it. No, I can. I can feel the emotion, right? I can feel the relationship between two friends. I can feel we're with the, the, the daughter and the mother, right? Which is, you know, wow. You know, it's like, it's such a, and, and one of the things about it is, is, you know, is for those that don't know, it's a, it's a long generational story. Um, it starts literally as, as two small girls or friends in, in a small Italian town. And then as they become older and they, they have their lives and how it changes and evolves. And like, it's just, it's so amazing in terms of like how we understand our psychological development as people. And that's what I think one of the things that makes it powerful, but that's my lens that I'm looking at it. I'm sure when you've read it, you, you have a different lens as well. You're looking at it for different things. Um, but in that way, there's not a right or wrong. And, and I don't have to, in, in what you're saying, necessarily know a history per se, or no, I don't have to know a, a an intention of the author, whomever, uh they she, he she or they may be <laughs> she, they, right. <laughs> right. Um, which is ironic because i actually don't care who the author is it's just good work which is kind of ironic here in the discussion but all that to say it's almost not necessary right no i don't i mean i think that's one of the things that makes the quartet so extremely powerful mm -hmm. and i actually think the question of intention is probably more closely linked to the question of identity that you just said you don't care about mm -hmm, mm -hmm, would mm -hmm. it matter to you or would it matter to me if it turned out that those novels had been written by a man mm -hmm. or would it matter to us if we learned that the author was a woman, but was not in fact Neapolitan and mm -hmm. wasn't even Italian, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. was a German transplant to right. Italy as, an, as, a, as a young girl. To me, none of that really touches what's going on in the novels themselves. I think it makes things about the pseudonym Elena Ferrante and the presence of Elenas throughout the novel and throughout the rest of what Ferrante has written playful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it makes it a source of mystery. And I think it does make us curious about the author figure. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that it changes necessarily yeah. the reaction that we have when we are reading the novels. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the way that it does change it, and I felt this a little bit when I was reading Frantumaglia, which were her mm -hmm. journals that she yep. released. Mm -hmm. Uh, perhaps the one way that it does change it is that it makes some of that staging of the disappearance of the author, which is also what's going on in the Neapolitan Quartet, right? Mm -hmm. It makes some of the staging of that a little bit too on the nose. Mm -hmm. And I can see why that would be irritating. Mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. readers. I have found myself irritated with it occasionally. Mm -hmm. but I think irritation is an interesting response. And mm -hmm. I think it's oh, the yeah. kind of response that makes us look at ourselves and think, Absolutely. well, what did I want? And Absolutely. where is that response coming from? Mm -hmm. And why do I feel so strongly or disproportionately mm -hmm. about something like anonymity, which every author has a right to? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I would simply say that whatever reaction we might have I, with or without the addition of information that mm -hmm. would help us read a book or contextualize a book or know something about the author, whatever response we might have is something that we can always analyze alongside the book itself. Mm -hmm. And so that's another way that we can deepen our 
reading and our understanding of it. Yeah, I firmly agree with you on that. I firmly, firmly agree with you that there's the reactions we have in the books we read or the things we watch tells more about ourselves and maybe our unconscious, um, you know, uh, ideas than anything about the book, which I think is is really, really, really fascinating. Actually, especially if you read books multiple times, you know, or stories multiple times, it's very interesting. I guess the last thing I'll say. I would on this, say we learn about. Can I just can I just yeah, clarify yeah, yeah, that? Yeah. I don't know that it tells us more about ourselves necessarily, but I think we learn about the subject and the object in tandem with one another, just to go back mm -hmm. to the language that we were mm -hmm. using before. I think it's a kind of dialectical mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. of coming to a deeper understanding, both of our own kind of reason mm -hmm. and of the way that the object is constructed. Yeah. To my mind, those things are always happening at the same time, and there's no need to sacrifice one on the altar of the other, which mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a great deal of contemporary criticism or scholarship that's interested in these questions of aesthetics and intent tends to do. It mm -hmm. says it can only be one or the other, but it can always be both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I agree with that. I guess the, the one last bit on this about the authorship thing is about um, many times it works in the reverse, right? Where people will say, well, yes, this work is good, or maybe it's really, you know, profound, mm -hmm. but the author was, you know, awful bad they, man they were awful they were terrible they were sexist misogynistic racist anti-semitic you know etc 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 and that taints the picture for people and and it becomes harder for people to separate the work from the artist and and all that stuff i mean what do you think about it in that way where it's like obviously those things should be considered but if if i if i push you and i say well if, okay if it's all about the work then all right so what about when we read stuff by some pretty terrible dudes or or, or ter terrible authors personally maybe in their personal life well if it's just about the work then that shouldn't matter or how do we play with that i guess a little bit i do think that's the beauty of holding on to the position that it's about the work and it's about history is that the individual author does become relatively irrelevant to these considerations and then those personal shortcomings don't really loom as large at least not for me as they might for other people i also think i'm just not that judgmental of people's personal shortcomings i mean i think that there are things we ought to judge harshly sure. I, you know racism being one of them mm -hmm. um egregious misogyny being another sure but these don't disqualify people's work for me mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i don't think that they should mm -hmm. um i suppose i would also add that the other i mean this isn't particularly well reasoned and i don't know if one could reason it well but something that something that Yun Fosso once said to me, or said to Damien, and I think Damien related to me, was that every author he's met who's a good writer also is a good person. <laughs> and I know that that is historically not true, but I do think that there are people who you read and you think there's something wrong with the work. There's something degraded here. There's a kind of cruelty which is another big interest of mine, but there's a kind of cruelty that isn't being put to any good purpose. There's a misogyny that leaps off the page or a kind of bad characterization of, of individuals along racial or sexual or gendered lines. And that comes off of the page, not primarily as a moral failure, but as a kind of aesthetic failure. Mm. And so mm. I don't think it's, impossible that sometimes the imaginative shortcomings of individuals make their way onto the page and you can react to the shortcomings of the work without necessarily having to condemn the person behind it yeah i mean you and i see this 110 percent the same i mean i <clears throat> it is the it is a fun conversation i have with people often and for me, it, I mean, there's almost, I, I, I agree, there are some things we should condemn or judge, but for me, it, the work is the work. And you could have a horrible person, quote unquote, but it has really good work. And 
I want to judge them on their work or critique them on their work and less so about their personal pieces. That that said, obviously there is parts of them that I guess come through in the work. Obviously someone sat down and wrote whatever it is, but I think it doesn't mm, it doesn't entirely bother me. It definitely doesn't pre- pre- prevent the, me from what's reading the psycho, it. What's the psychoanalytic explanation for <laughs> that? I mean, is it a form of projection or sublimation or what what is on the which end on the authors or on are on you and i being okay with it well no let's talk about the author first and <laughs> then talk about us <laughs> um yeah i think it is some some aspect of i mean sublimation is usually seen in a positive way it's the defense that you're trying to do um but sometimes it is a type of displacement so they're taking something about them and they're putting it into something else but Freud yeah. says sublimation isn't always beautiful, right? Like sublimation. Yeah, can yeah, be, yeah, not always. Be, no, I think it's it's something that can be adaptively used. But you know, all you know, defenses are you know trying to you know again they're trying to you know block something or prevent us paying attention to something. And so you know, but yeah, so it's not always great. But um, yeah, I think that there is something about that process though as well of like okay how do you then have insight and then you recognize it and you're trying to 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 manage it but um yeah and i and i haven't figured out why i'm so okay with it maybe i'm just too morally fluid or something i don't know (laughs) i don't i don't know Um, it's for me it's more that i don't know what that kind of moral judgment would do in the world like I, I I don't understand what the point of me in particular condemning dead writers for their personal shortcomings would be. I see the point in me condemning them for their work mm-hmm. because that's what I do professionally, or that's one of the things that I do professionally is evaluate and justify my evaluations of people's writing. And that feels like it can have a kind of effect in the world, Mm -hmm. but it's unclear to me what effect condemning people for their bad behavior would have. Yeah, I agree. I mean, my, my world is human behavior. And for me, I'm, it's what, I mean, humans are so complicated. I mean, you know, you, you can take somebody that is you know morally repugnant on some things and then they are absolutely wonderful in other areas right and and in fact many again there are limits i think to some of this stuff right and but i think you know i agree i think we have to say how do we judge and critique the work and that's maybe most important obviously i could give you and i'm sure you've heard this you know you have plenty of counters to what you're saying like why would i judge the person i mean there's plenty of counters to that which i you know, I personally don't feel, I don't, I don't, I don't really think that way. I don't enjoy doing that. I think, I think that's a really slippery slope because then we're, we're missing, you know, really good art. We're missing really good creation that can be put in the world. And that's what lives on past person. And that's the, and that's, and to me that has in some ways, uh, you know, I think, you know, more value, but you know, I think it's, I think in some scenarios it can be tricky, but yes, I mean, I'm, I don't know. I, it, it bothers me that not so much either. But um, okay, I want to ask you about genre. Okay. So, genre can be important for many things, many literary functions. Um, so, I mentioned Edie Hirsch. He talks about intrinsic intrinsic genre, which is uh, moving away from generalities and more to specific genre that presents in the text itself. Mm-hmm. So, what do you think about this merging or crossing of genres? So, narrative with poetry or historical with narrative. So, maybe just tell us how you define genre and what is what is its value or importance, you know, if at all. And you can chat about intrinsic genre as well. I, I think about genre the way that Todorov thinks about genre, which is that a genre comes into being through a, a genre comes into being over time. And it comes into being over time through this interplay between stability by positing a certain set of fixed conventions for artistic creation and artistic consumption. And at the same time, with there being change or flexibility Mm. in those conventions. Mm. So somewhat paradoxically, it's this interplay between stability and flexibility, stability and change, Mm. 
that makes genres visible to us across time. And I think I keep saying time or I keep stressing that because I think it's really important that we think about genres as historical, as being capable of evolving, uh, of evolving in response to different kinds of institutional or social or historical or political conditions. And that we don't, and that we aren't sloppy mm. or hasty with mm. the way that we anoint and name new genres. So I think a lot about this in the context of a contemporary genre like auto fiction, mm. which people clearly have some investment in claiming as a distinctive genre. But once you start putting pressure, on what makes it distinctive, what makes it different from, say, memoir on the one hand, or nonfiction prose on the other, or the novel, I you start running into conceptual problems mm. with the claims that are made to prop up the uniqueness of the genre or to separate it from genres that have come before it. So that's just why I'm stressing time and change Mm -hmm. as opposed to what I think other people stress, which is rupture and invention. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so I guess on that, to, if, if it's changing and evolving through time, there can be a merging or crossing of genres. I guess the question I have is, is what, I guess, what's the utility or importance mm -hmm. of particular uh, contours or, or parameters yeah. around genre, if at all? That's a great question. I think the importance of the contours or the permeable boundaries around genres is that those boundaries teach us how to read works that belong to a particular kind of genre. So for instance, it would make no sense to read a tragedy as if it were a comedy, mm -hmm. or it would make no sense to read a melodramatic novel as if it were a realist one, mm -hmm. or it would make no sense to read a magical realist novel as if it were a straight up realist one. <laughs> so I think that the importance of genre or the importance of the discourse of genre is that it allows us to set certain expectations for how we read individual examples of the type. And then it allows us to measure to measure the example against the type, as opposed to measuring the example against something that bears absolutely no relation to it. Another example of this I can give is that I think that there is a trend in contemporary criticism to treat novels as if they were history mm -hmm. and to fault them for not accurately representing or not doing the kind of mm -hmm. uh, excavational political work that history might do or for not representing say the viewpoints of everyone who belongs to a particular kind of social identity mm -hmm. category and to me that's a failure of genre or of generic thinking yeah. because you are expecting a work of fiction to do something that works of fiction do not set out to do mm -hmm or you are expecting counterfactual histories to do something that works of history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in any event, it, it sets up, I think, incorrect standards for the judgments of these works, and it sets up poor justifications for those judgments. So to me, that's why the discourse of genre is important, because it properly calibrates our expectations and thus allows us to make both better judgments and justifications for how we believe an example represents or fails to represent, lives up to or fails to live up to the best possible version of its type. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's, it's very nicely said. I think that's, I think that that is really, really important for. It gives us a kind of event schema. Right? This is what's going to happen when you when you have this or type of script. It gives us a, um, not script, but like a, a expectation, right? Like this is right. okay. I'm not expecting, you know, history. Right. Now, of course, there's different ways to write history for sure. But, you know, if something's historical fiction, well, you know, it's it's fictitious. It's, it's, it's not trying to be, you know, straight history. And right. so there is, I guess, in terms of the expectations, it, it is those kind of contours. So mm. we talked about. Thinking, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I was thinking about a recent example of this, which is 
uh, the novelist Elif Batuman wrote this wonderful novel called Either Or. And the protagonist in that novel is interested in how, or you can tell from the vantage point of the present, because it's set in the 90s, in the mid 90s, the novel, you can tell from the vantage point of the present that there is a certain irony in the fact that the protagonist is not entirely aware of what's going on in, say, feminist academia or feminist politics Hmm. at the time that she's in college, which makes sense because she's a 19-year-old college student. Why should she know those things? Hmm. But she's interestingly living out different models of heteronormativity or compulsory heterosexuality. And you can, again, tell that those discourses are in the air, but she's not like attuned to them exactly. Mm. And she's like, why is there no language for me to understand why dating men feel so bad? And it was fascinating for me to see reviewers review that novel and say, but there were people writing about this. There were people writing about this. It's not right that there was nobody writing about this. And you think, well, this is this is an expression that's been offered to us from the point of view of a 19 year old Mm. protagonist. It's not making the claim that this simply wasn't being written about. Mm -hmm. It's allowing us to see the world as it has been focalized through the eyes of this particular character. So it's those kinds, do do you see what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. that's the the sort of example that comes to mind when I think Mm -hmm. about a failure of proper generic thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, I, I, I I definitely agree with you on that. Um, okay, so I want to ask you about interpretation. We kind of touched on this a little bit uh, earlier, but uh, there's different, obviously, models and things like that. You can have a casual, a literal, a metaphorical interpretation of a text. Um, with any of those three or others, how can we try to have um, an accurate interpretation of the text? So again, kind of this kind of uh, rigor or this really good approach towards understanding uh, literature or, or or just any type of work, how can we not be so, you know, cavalier or pedestrian or flippant with it and try to say, okay, what is, what are the interpretive uh, uh, tools and skills we have to understand the, this work and in, in, in this text? So I think that there are two different kinds of interpretation or two different purposes of interpretation we might want to think about. One of them, as you say, is accuracy. Another is persuasiveness. Mm -hmm. So there is an accurate interpretation and there is a persuasive interpretation. Mm -hmm. And I think that those two things can overlap. There is that sweet spot, that Venn diagram sweet (laughs) spot where they come together, but they don't always. And I think that's where you end up with readings that feel frustrating or feel partial or feel incorrect or feel simply boring. Mm -hmm. I think that when we talk about accuracy, before we talk about interpretation, we need to talk about something like description. Mm -hmm. I am astounded in academic criticism where there is no fact-checking of claims or quotation the degree to which people simply fail to describe accurately what is happening in a particular work. Mm. And I think it's very, very difficult to aspire to something like an accurate interpretation without having first and foremost accurate description. And I think accurate description itself can break down in a couple of different ways. You can have accurate description of something like plot points or of character or what have you, but you can also have accurate description of something like tone. So whether something is being offered to us straight, as it were, or whether it was being (laughs) offered to us ironically or satirically, you can have an accurate description of voice, i.e. when a third person narrator uh, is is utilizing free indirect discourse, whose voice are they drawing on, whose mind or whose consciousness is being wrapped up in that third person narration. You can have an accurate description of things like the relationship between details and the whole, between mm-hmm. events and narration between what's going on at the sentence level, the paragraph level, and the chapter level of a novel. 
So I think anytime you start writing criticism, the first thing that you're really thinking about before you even get to interpretation is the accuracy of description across all of these different categories Mm -hmm. and across all of these different scales. Mm -hmm. Then I think once you get to interpretation, it's impossible, I think, to produce either an accurate or a persuasive interpretation without thinking of all of the other possible interpretations that orbit around sure. your particular interpretation. Right. And I know you know this because you were in the seminary, right? I know you know this because this is part of your training and the way that I imagine you think about exegesis as well, which is mm-hmm. that behind every interpretation are the interpretations that preceded it or right. are the ghosts of the interpretations yeah. that did not come into fruition. Mm-hmm. And so I think you are always thinking not only about the accuracy of description, but the accuracy of interpretation vis-a-vis other possibilities, other kinds or configurations of arguments, other aspects of a text that can be stressed that you are not going to stress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I would just say that once you have that in hand, then you're thinking about persuasion. And persuasion of interpretation is always about audience. What might be persuasive to you as a reader might not be persuasive to my colleagues in an English department (laughs) as a reader. And so then persuasion comes together with accuracy. And I think that it comes together around questions of style, the Mm -hmm. style of criticism. Mm -hmm. How is it that I take what was previously nearly accurate and turn it into something that is persuasive to an audience that I imagine? Mm -hmm. You're, I like the way you explain it. It's sort of where my my train of thought was going. So g- give me give me a little runway here. So I wanted yeah. to ask about verbal meaning, right? That was my next question, right? And there's various ways in which people look at this. So I'll just for listeners, just kind of lay out some of this. So you have a referential theory, which was Bertrand Russell shows the relationship between the referent and the words themselves. You have ideational theory, John Locke liked this, focus on the words themselves for understanding communication. Stimulus response theory, one of the uh, listener's response to communication situation, and then the meaning as a function of use theory pushed by Wittgenstein, who was the, you know, the great pragmatist and utilitarian for meaning from language. So I'm, I'm laying those out because how do we uh, not have like an allegiance to one of them, but how do we parse out the value of many theories of one's hermeneutics on the kind of accuracy as you were describing? Mm. And how do we go about seeking the meaning from text and literature by understanding verbal meaning and from the actual text uh, itself. I just want to make sure I understand that question. So the question is, when we have all of these different possible models for interpretation, what does accuracy mean or what can accuracy mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, especially as how you're understanding the words or, you know, the the, the um, structure of the grammar, you know, there's the language component of things, but how do we understand verbal meaning from mm-hmm. a text uh, uh, specifically? And again, you can look at different ways how it's, you know, between the words themselves or communication or the meaning from language. There's all the different models, but how do we try to say you know, maybe this goes back to what genre is, right? Of well, in this genre, yeah, no, these are our expectations. Does. I think it does. I think it goes back to genre, and I think it goes back to history. Mm. I mean, the the thinker that I would add to your pantheon here would be Mikhail Bakhtin, mm-hmm. and I would say that the Bakhtin school of socio linguistics was thinking precisely about how it is that genre determines what is intelligible to us and how it is intelligible to us. Mm. The point where Bakhtin would have said something like what literature is at a given moment in history can only be understood through the institutions that bring the genre of literature into being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, yeah, absolutely. I think that all of those models are wonderful and useful in different kinds of ways and for answering different kinds of problems. Mm. But that ultimately, anytime we are talking about intelligibility, anytime we are talking about accuracy or persuasiveness for that matter, we are always using those terms against a horizon Mm. of shared generic expectations. Mm. 
I think a lot about this Lydia Davis short story that I like called they take turns using a word they like. Mm-hmm. And it's a very short, short story in Lydia Davis's way. It's two lines. In the first line, the first line reads, it is extraordinary, the woman said. And in that line, is, is italicized. Mm-hmm. And the next line of the story is, it is extraordinary, the woman said. And in that line, extraordinary is italicized. Mm -hmm. And I think that that story is so marvelous. I think I've actually probably, um, I I don't think I've quoted it exactly correctly, but you will forgive me. The the gist of it is more (laughs) or less correct. (laughs) But I think that story is amazing for getting at precisely this question Mm -hmm. and the way that this question is basically impossible to answer Mm -hmm. in the absence of certain grounding assumptions about genre. So where are these women speaking? Are they at a kind of fancy luncheon, which is what it sounds like to me? (laughs) Or are they critics sitting around talking about how a word is extraordinary, which critics do all the time? (laughs) And which word exactly is extraordinary? Is it the word is that is being highlighted? Is Mm -hmm. it the word extraordinary? Is it some third word that exists off of the page somewhere? And who are these women? And why are they speaking to each other? And what is their relationship to one another? Is the first one ordering the second one? Is the second one correcting the first one? Right? All of these yeah. questions, the answers to them would build up a kind of speech scenario mm-hmm. within which we could begin to make sense of or produce an accurate interpretation or a persuasive interpretation of that story. Yeah. And in the absence of those things, it becomes a story about how we create accurate or persuasive interpretations of stories or of speech acts. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's I, I'm not familiar with it, but as you explain it, it is something that is you know basically stripping down everything in this kind of minimalist way of saying like, where do we emphasize things, right? Mm-hmm. And what are what is the kind of you know shelf that we have to have these expectations of you know all of these potential questions? And so I, I think it is important to say, you know, how are we looking at you know? There's the kind of mm, sometimes the kind of parochial granular way of reading something but then also what is the the kind of gestalt of it which well i think i think this is another question that gets back not exactly to history but to something like education Mm. and the institutions of education i don't know if you experience this with your child but one of the things that i'm seeing with my children Mm -hmm. is how different my sense of how they should be reading is from how they are taught to read in the classroom Mm -hmm. So the way that they are taught to read in the classroom is extremely slow. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. They they really stress a kind of slow, grammatically attentive Mm. reading that takes into account the syntactical relationships between words more than it takes into account, I think, comprehension or even enjoyment. Mm -hmm. And at home, the way that I read with my kids is primarily for pleasure. Mm -hmm. And also for, I think, a kind of, I wouldn't say moral instruction, but a kind of like ethical Mm. uh, communication or ethical conversation that we have about, you know, why did this character do this? What do you think he was thinking? How do you think this other character felt? Was it right? Was it wrong? And like I said, none of those are offered dogmatically, but rather just to try to talk about what Mm. is what is going on. And so I think that, you know, one qualifier I might add to the conversation we've been having is simply that reading takes place primarily in institutions of education. Mm -hmm. And the way that we train people to read takes place primarily in institutions of education. Mm -hmm. And at the different levels of the educational system and in different countries too, Mm -hmm. the way that people stress how it is that children should read or what it is that students should be reading is vastly, vastly, vastly different. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of education also sets up these generic horizons against which interpretation or criticism, whether accurate or persuasive, gains its power and its legibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let me let me build off of that. So, 
uh, one of the the questions I was having here was was well, where do you find I guess the role of uh, both in terms of finding the total meaning, sub meanings, and traits of a type of text. So, for example, I'm I'm pretty sure it's Gadamer who was following Heidegger on the the four having discussed this idea of understanding the full gestalt of a text to get the essence of a text. Mm-hmm. So, where do you make kind of what you were describing there before, of having this unity or context to then understand the specifics of the text? How how do you see that kind of like uh, push pull interplay there? Exactly like that as a push-pull interplay, or maybe just to resurrect a word that I mentioned before, it's always as a dialectic. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah, yeah. That, I think that what everyone who writes or thinks seriously about literary texts understands is that there is a very intricate relationship that is formed between the part and the whole, such that the whole is always going to be more than just the sum of the part, right, mm-hmm. of the part. And you need the parts and you need to understand the parts in order to get at the whole, but they are not thoroughly exhaustive of it. Mm. And so in a more practical sense, I would simply say that when one is reading, you are always going back and forth in your own mind Mm -hmm. between what I tend to think of as local effects Mm. and global ones or Or, yeah, I, I do think local and global. I mean, that's that's not a particularly uh, well thought out terminology, but it's the one that's kind of yeah. popping mm-hmm. in my mind as I'm reading. And that you are always trying to figure out how the local effects add up to the feel mm. of the whole or how the local effects add up to the tone or the mood mm-hmm. of the whole. And that this is simply another way that we read in addition to the four or five different plural ways of reading that I was elaborating mm-hmm. for you at the beginning of our conversation. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I, I kind of, you know, want to end here is I, you wrote a absolutely fantastic piece in the New Yorker on, on the book heaven. And I believe the, the title, if I get the title, right. The title of it was a Japanese novelist tale of bullying and Nietzsche. Uh, this was in <laughs> June of last year. Um, it was a marvelous uh, essay or piece, and so I, I, it really stuck with me. And and I had read the book already, and so I was, and I absolutely loved it. I thought it was brilliant um, for for a lot of reasons. So I, I wanted to definitely ask you about it. Um, so <laughs> um, we can just maybe it'll, maybe it'll be our case study, if you will. So sure. what do you? Th- much of the book is there is a moral element here. So what do you think of the origins of morality seen in the two main characters uh, and how that, what that shows us about humanity overall or, or in general, I guess. So maybe a little bit of background for people who haven't read it. Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Is that Miyako Kawakami on her website writes that heaven was a retelling of Nietzsche's thus spoke Zarathustra. Mm. And so obviously the first thing that I did was I had read Beyond Good and Evil, but I hadn't read Zarathustra. So I went and read read it before. No, I hadn't read it before I read the Kawakami. So I went and and read it to see what she meant when she called it a rewriting. And did you enjoy it? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And to me, there were two aspects of the rewriting that I found extremely interesting. The first is that as a friend and I were joking, there's something about Nietzsche that is a little bit adolescent. When you Uh, read mm. him in Zarathustra, you know, my friend Ben Parker does a good impression of Nietzsche writing Zarathustra where he just sort of puts his hand on his forehead and he goes, society, man. (laughs) (laughs) And so there is something a little bit embarrassingly teenage Mm, about moments of Nietzsche's writing. And there's also something completely exhilarating. And as Sian Nai describes his style, something zany Mm -hmm, about mm -hmm, it that's extremely mm -hmm. appealing. And so I thought Mieko's decision to set the novel in a middle school Mm -hmm. and to have the, the avatars of Nietzsche's philosophy be teenagers who were being bullied, I thought that was a wonderful decision because I thought it got at a kind of judgment Mm 
that mm-hmm. many of us have when we read Nietzsche, which is the essential adolescence of his like style mm-hmm. and attitude, right? Yeah. So that was one thing that I thought was interesting about the rewriting. The second thing that I thought was interesting about the rewriting is that, you know, Mieko in that book has a central character, a protagonist, mm-hmm. the narrator, mm-hmm. uh, whose name we never learn, but who is called Eyes mm-hmm. by by the kids that bully him and this is because he has a um he has what's the what's the term for it he has a um he has a, it's not a wandering eye what's it what's it called it's a lazy eye he has a lazy eye sorry yeah, he has yeah. a lazy eye. yeah he has a lazy eye and so he's called eyes by the kids at school that bully him and Nietzsche, of course, in Zarathustra, but also in his other writing, is sort of preoccupied with the eye and the capacity to see. And so that's a kind of perfect, mm-hmm. perfect appropriation of mm-hmm. that trope from Nietzsche by Mieko. And Eyes makes friends with a girl named Kojima. And Kojima is or becomes this sort of uh, priestly a figure, this preacher for the value of suffering on earth because there will be another life, a heaven, in which that suffering can be redeemed. And against Kojima, there is this other character um, whose name I'm forgetting now, I don't know if you remember, but who becomes the who becomes the um the spokesman for the kind of conventional reading of Nietzsche, where morality is simply a social construction, and it is the people with power who decide what is good and what is bad. And there is absolutely no meaning to suffering because there is no afterlife in which that suffering will be redeemed. And so the narrator becomes kind of caught Mm -hmm. between these two, between these two voices that are in his mind. And to me, this was unbelievable. And I won't give the ending away for those who haven't read it, but you really should read it because the ending is kind of magical, realist, melodramatic, spectacular, Mm -hmm. uh, and beautifully, beautifully, beautifully written. I mean, it is one of those novels that starts out quite self-consciously restrained Mm -hmm. in its style and then explodes into kind of aesthetic bliss by the time we get to the end. And I love that about it. What I thought that... What I thought Mieko did that was incredible in rewriting Nietzsche was finding ways to complicate the kind of conventional readings Mm. of him. Mm. And so she gives us these two characters who would see each seem to be voicing different aspects of his philosophy or different critiques. But she enmeshes them in a set of human relations that makes it absolutely impossible for us to simply dismiss say, the priest like Kojima as being an agent of mystification, because she does provide the narrator with a sense of belonging. She does provide him with a sense of erotic Mm self-actualization. She provides him even with a sense of power. And you start to wonder whether you start to wonder whether it is all bullshit Mm -hmm. that suffering won't be redeemed in some kind of afterlife. And at the same time, you have the other character who is powerful and who does seem to be kind of ripping the veil from his eyes and empowering the narrator uh, to critique conventional structures of morality. And so I think it's a profoundly, sorry, this is the third time I've used this word, but I think it's a profoundly dialectical Mm -hmm. novel. And it shows us that Nietzsche or any kind of philosophical system and any kind of interpretive model, say, for reading is never an endpoint. But it's only a way station in the journey that our thought takes. Mm. And that's what I think the novel demonstrates so beautifully and what I take away from it, at least, which is that even if this is a kind of Nietzschean novel or a Nietzschean allegory, the whole point of it is that we have to keep thinking. We have to keep interpreting. We have to keep judging and we have to keep justifying and we have to keep writing criticism, right? Mm. And so to me, that is the that is the marvel of the novel, that it does all that. And it does it through this like extremely viscerally harrowing story of teenage pain and and love and desire. Yeah, no, you say it very nicely. And I would agree. I think it's a really accurate reading of Nietzsche's philosophy because he was very much enamored with, you know, pre-Socratics and with, you know, particularly Heraclitus. And it was always this becoming 
Life is a is that kind of way station. And in fact, even in his very kind of like, you know, uh, sarcastic or or very um, ways in which he would write, you know, he would sometimes end his sentences with ellipsis points. He wouldn't even finish it, right? It was because it was just really just this: where could this go? And 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 even in in how. Um, and how he's writing in one way, he's very simple and direct, but then he has all these layers of it as well. And I think in, in the book, it really gets at that of like all of these components of our humanity and how our relationships shape us and all of these kinds of things. He's saying, well, how do we try to understand, you know, the suffering in the world or how do we understand if there is or is not an afterlife or what happens where, you know, when, when things end, but all of it is, is trying to say like, how do we how are we understanding the life we're living at and at different moments or different points? And again, the, the novel does such a good job of trying to not give an answer, but really wrestle with all of these different compartments or components of, of, of life and relationships and, and suffering in the world. And, and so I, I fully agree. I mean, again, your, your, your piece was great and, and the, the novel is, is, is fantastic. And so it is just so, um, I found it as, I mean, many people get Nietzsche, I think, I don't want to say wrong, but I think they're kind of maybe off the mark of some of his stuff. And I found her, her book so, I mean, just so closer to that kind of way in which he talked about things and just a really like kind of fresh air of sorts of. of yeah, no, it really is. Nietzsche. I mean, the other, the other novelist who I think is essentially Nietzschean, which is to say, I think that she is a, uh, thinking about systems of morality in the same way that Kawakami is, is someone like Rachel Cusk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read Second Place, which is her most recent novel. I don't think I've read that one. What's the one before that? The one before that is the trilogy, Outline, Transit, and Kudos. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it, some of that is present there, but it's much more explicit in Second Place. I mean, there are actual references, explicit references to Nietzsche in it. And the artist figures in that are presented as being these Nietzschean, these Nietzschean men who are, who in their readings of Nietzsche have made themselves amoral. And the narrator, the kind of Kuskian narrator of the novel is, is pushing back against amorality as a place where one can settle. Because again, I think it's the same point that Kawakami is making, that once you have let your thought or your ideas about morality and art settle, then you've lost the energy, the essence mm. that was so important and that animated all of Nietzsche's philosophy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and that's that part of being and becoming, as she writes, and she's borrowing from D.H. Lawrence there, who's also borrowing from Nietzsche, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I, part of being and becoming is never settling into right. any fixed form. It's about always undoing yourself and, mm -hmm. and remaking yourself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to me, that is what some of the most interesting novels right now are considering and are considering it in dialogue with not just Nietzsche, but other other mm -hmm. philosophers mm -hmm. and philosophers mm -hmm. of language. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, two quick questions. Yes. Um, what do you think about film adaptations or television show adaptations of of classic books or even more current stuff? I know, do you... I'm a bad person to ask this question to. I cannot, I just fall right asleep trying to watch TV or movies. I really, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, since having children... <laughs> something it, it's 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 rewired my mind in some way it's like white I, noise. it really i mean it really is it's <laughs> just like its only purpose is to put me to sleep so i that's not a truly 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 not a judgment i think that is about me uh not about what's on the screen but mm -hmm, i mm -hmm. just don't i can't remember the last time i went to a movie theater. but it doesn't bother you if like there are and it's like oh they no, didn't get no, this no, accurate no, or no. you don't care about that I'm not, I'm not bothered by anything you <laughs> 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 that's good okay i can't i can never do i would never do this to you but um maybe tell me you know past and present a little bit who are some of your favorite authors who are mm. some of the or some of the books that are just like if i were to ask somebody like tell me tell me about you through what books 
just really kind of speak to you or capture your essence? What what are those novels or books or authors? What what, what would they be? Oh my goodness, what an impossible question. Yeah, it's, it's super hard. Just anything, anything that really you just come back to years and years and years. Dostoevsky just you know sunk his you know way into me, and I will I read Crime and Punishment every year, and I absolutely love it. Um, I, teach, I teach Lolita every year. Mm, interesting. I never get tired of it and I never fail to cry mm, at mm. the end, even though I know I'm being tricked. <laughs> right. And there's something amazing to me about the way that novel thinks about. I've said this, I think, earlier in the conversation that cruelty is something that I'm perennially interested in. Mm -hmm. But there's something amazing to me about how that novel thinks about the relationship between cruelty and art mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. way that it thinks about what it means to hurt people and what it means to aestheticize people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that those are two of my enduring preoccupations. And I come back to them every year in Lolita. What just just I guess just to clarify, when you all types of cruelty, or are we talking about cruelty between people? Or and yeah. are we talking about cruelty emotionally and psychologically or actually physically or just the total? Oh yeah, thing? physical cruelty doesn't interest me very so, so it's that emotional, psychological. Yeah, it uh -huh. is. Yeah, it is emotional, psychological, and the way that it can be even in inadvertent. I was going to say, it, is there an intentional or unintended way of that, th that yeah. piece of it too? You know, I taught, I, so I taught this class this past term called Love and Other Useless Pursuits. And it was interesting it, how much in a class on love, the question of cruelty arose. And the question of cruelty usually arose in conjunction with the question, what do I owe this person and what does this person owe me? And it arose through an inability for people in the novels that we were reading to answer that question. Mm. So one of the more memorable examples of that was James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room, which I mm. also teach every year. Mm. And That's I great. teach usually right after Lolita. So I think of those two as oh, actually nice. Nice. Um, And Gillian Rose's amazing book, Love's Work. Mm -hmm. And one of the places we ended our conversation about Giovanni's room as a class was with the understanding that the point of the novel and the point of the emotional or psychological journey that David, the narrator, takes through it is to come into closer contact with himself, mm. a self whose desires and whose actions and responsibilities he has spent the entirety of the novel denying. Mm -hmm. And what's horrible about the moment he comes into contact with himself is that he realizes that he is cowardly and that he is irresponsible and that he is not careful with other people. Mm. And so the question we ended that class with is, what does it mean when the self that you come into the closest and most intimate contact with is not a person you like, is not a person you would describe mm. as good? Yeah. What do you do with that? Mm. And Jillian Rose then provides an answer to it. And she says that what love's work is, is embracing that forlorn, loveless, abject child, mm. inner child mm. as mm. your own. Yeah, yeah, and doing yeah. it over and over and over again, even mm. if you know that you might be destined to fail. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So to me, that's a very powerful way of thinking about what the, I think the, I think writing, I don't want to say the novel necessarily, but what a certain kind of novel or a certain kind of writing like Rose's work can teach us about the relationship between cruelty and love mm -hmm. and the relationship between different people's interpretations to get back to that mm -hmm. that topic that we've been talking about different people's interpretations mm -hmm. uh, and how accuracy persuasiveness might ultimately end up in certain forms of human relation to be beside the point mm -hmm. yeah yeah well look I mean, I could talk to you all day about all of this. It's so, so, so wonderful. I, I want to be respectful of your time, obviously. Um, can you just tell us really quick uh, where people can can find you and find your work and where are the best places? Mm, sure. I am, My website is merveemre.com. You can find my essays and articles there. I'm on Twitter. 
at Mervatum, M-E-R-V-A-T-I-M. And I am usually in the pages of the New Yorker and the New York Review of Books. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a such a, a delight and a really big honor. And so I, I can't say enough thanks. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. <laughs>